This video is meant to be an introduction to polar coordinates. First, let's review standard Cartesian coordinates. You've probably worked with these quite a bit. When you write down the coordinates of a point as x, y, the first coordinate is telling you the horizontal displacement from the origin, and the second coordinate is telling you the vertical displacement. So for example, the point 3, 2 is where you would arrive if you started at the origin, moved to the right 3 units, and then moved up 2 units. Similarly, negative 2, 4 is where you arrive when you go 2 steps to the left, 4 steps up from the origin, and 1, negative 3, 1 step to the right, and 3 steps down. Using Cartesian coordinates, it's very easy to describe vertical and horizontal lines, they're simply the set of points for which one of the coordinates is constant. But you could imagine using different information to describe where you are in the plane. So we could let r stand for the radial distance from the origin, and we could let theta represent a direction as measured from the positive x-axis moving counterclockwise, and we're going to measure in radians. Now we'll notice that the positive x-axis could be described either as theta equals 0 or as theta equals 2 pi. So there's a redundancy here, but actually there's a redundancy everywhere. The coordinates theta and theta plus k2 pi represent the same direction for all integer values of k. Let's look at an example. Where is 4 comma pi over 3? So the radial distance from the origin is 4. And our direction is going to be pi over 3 measured from the positive x-axis. That means this is the point we're describing. But as we saw, polar coordinates are not unique. So let's explore this example some more. Here's how we originally thought of this point. Pi over 3 radians from the positive x-axis measured counterclockwise and then 4 units away from the origin. But we could add 2 pi to the direction coordinate, and that means we'd circle around and then arrive at this direction, and then of course move 4 units out. So 4 comma 7 pi over 3 are also polar coordinates of the same point. But we could also subtract 2 pi from the direction coordinate and obtain negative 5 pi over 3. So in this case, we would travel 5 pi over 3 units clockwise from the positive x-axis and moving 4 units out once again arrive at the same point. Here's a sneaky possibility. We could add pi to the coordinate pi over 3. And by doing so, we're sort of pointing in the opposite direction which might seem like a problem, except if we back up by taking r to be negative 4, we once again arrive at the same position. So here's a pretty non-standard way to do it. Usually, when you're describing points in the plane using polar coordinates, you try to use a positive value of r, but it's important to interpret what happens when r is negative because you will often have to do so when you're dealing with polar equations. So this is yet another way to describe the very same point in the plane. Polar coordinates are non-unique. There are infinitely many ways to describe the same point. So let's talk about conversion formulas. How do we go back and forth between polar coordinates and Cartesian coordinates? So what we'll do is we'll look at a point in the plane and we will imagine that we've described both the Cartesian and polar coordinates for that point. So here they are, x, y, r, and theta. Now we're going to use some simple right triangle trigonometry. So the ratio x over r gives us cosine theta, and the quotient y over r gives us sine theta. So here we have simple equations which allow us to move from polar to Cartesian coordinates. If we know r and theta, we can quickly generate the values of x and y that describe the same point. Now we can also notice that the Pythagorean formula tells us that r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared and the ratio y over x gives us tan theta. We can interpret these equations to give us the conversion from Cartesian to polar coordinates. If we wanted to, we could solve for r and theta explicitly like so, 
I'm a little leery of using these as my conversion formulas for Cartesian to polar because they put a restriction on you. For example, the square root of any number is always non-negative. So if you use this equation, you're already forgetting the possibility that r might be negative. Similar comments apply to theta. If you use the arctangent function, then you're restricting the possible angles that come out of this conversion. We're going to look at that later in this video. My suggestion is to stick with this version of the Cartesian to polar conversion formulas. Let's take a look at the conversion formulas in action. So let's find the Cartesian coordinates for a point whose polar coordinates are 2 comma pi over 5. Now we could draw a simple sketch. So we're 2 units away from the origin and we are pi over 5 units away from the x-axis. Let's convert to degrees just to get a sense of where we are. It's about 36 degrees. It's actually 36 degrees on the nose. And so this is the point we're looking for right here. We want the Cartesian coordinates. The formulas are quite easy. x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta. And just plugging in that data, we find that the coordinates are approximately 1.6 comma 1.2. If we superimpose the Cartesian grid, you can see that these seem reasonable. By the way, a fun fact, this point is a vertex of a regular pentagon, and the exact coordinates happen to be 1 plus root 5 over 2, square root of 5 minus root 5 over 2. So now let's go in the other direction. Let's find the polar coordinates for a point whose Cartesian coordinates are 5 comma 3. It's always a good idea to sort of draw a sketch and get a rough idea of what's going on, but here's the point 5 comma 3, and we're looking for r and theta in this picture. So we know r squared is 5 squared plus 3 squared, and we know tan theta is 3 over 5. And so we can easily solve these equations to find that r is the square root of 34, and theta is arctan of 3 fifths. The polar coordinates are root 34, arctan of 3 fifths, or approximately 5.8 comma 0 0.5. But remember, polar coordinates are never unique. So we've got some other possibilities. We could, for example, add 2 pi to our theta coordinate and arrive at the same point. Or we could subtract 2 pi from the theta coordinate. Or we could add pi and go backwards root 34, and so on. So let's try another example of moving from Cartesian to polar coordinates. Let's find the polar coordinates for a point whose Cartesian coordinates are negative 5, negative 2. So in this case, we're over here in the third quadrant. And we'll notice that r should be root 29. And we'll play the same game to see that tangent theta equals 2 fifths. And I suppose that means that theta is arctan of 2 fifths. Well, we need to be very careful about this. Here's the warning I mentioned earlier about simply using arctan to solve this kind of problem. Remember what the graph of arctan looks like. There are horizontal asymptotes at negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. The range of arctan is the open interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Anytime you apply the arctan function, you are getting a number between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So what does that mean in this case? It means that the theta we have just calculated actually lies somewhere in the first or fourth quadrant. So what's going on? What's going on is we found this direction. We actually want to go in the opposite direction. So what we really should do is take this value, arctan 2 fifths, and we need to add pi to it. So what we had was incorrect, and what we really need is this. By the way, there's a sneaky solution. We could have held on to the original value, arctan of 2 fifths, for our direction coordinate, but instead moved backwards. Now it's okay if you're a little grumpy about this. This is not usually the way we describe points in polar coordinates. In polite company, you tend to try to describe points using polar coordinates with the positive value for r.